great citadels of sand can be found throughout much of the world today. These castles are home to the termites, built from their saliva which hardens the sand. Termites are insects related to cockroaches that live in massive colonies, and the mounds shelter fungi that the termites use to digest cellulose. Some of these termites have a very basic relationship with the fungi, simply allowing them to take up residence or building around a plant to make a humid enough environment for fungi to grow. Ants do the same thing, independently learning that fungi can do the tough digestion for them, but one family of termites have taken this proclivity to an extreme. Termites of Macrotermites are quite possibly the first organism to practice agriculture. Their long-standing relationship with the mushroom genus, aptly named Termitomyces, goes back to the Oligocene. One of the first steps when a termite queen and king settle a new territory at the beginning of the wet season is for the first worker offspring leaving to gather spores from the mushroom, along with some floral debris. They grow these spores in carefully and instinctively crafted chambers and enhance their growth with hormones. Although the termite mounds protect the colony, another significant purpose is to create a humid shelter for their cultivated mushrooms to grow. Workers can open and close tunnels to regulate the airflow, humidity, and temperature of the nest's interior. This is especially important when dealing with brush fires, and you're going to want to put a pin in that one. Termites often construct their mounds in very arid environments, sometimes in deserts. In these environments, a centralized location of protein-rich insects, trapped water, and nutritious mushrooms will make these termites a keystone species. Although Macrotermites has been cultivating fungi since the Oligocene on Earth, it was not until the Miocene that they were introduced to Chimere. Shortly after their introduction, these termites spread far and fast. Optimal habitat was common in the northern range of the known world, as there wasn't much in the way of competition. Other termites have been in Chimere since the Cretaceous, but most were relegated to the forests. The genus Macrotermites developed several species very quickly, and were successfully becoming specialists of the fern prairies. Macrotermes arrived on the eastern continent a million years after their introduction. By then, they and their fungal crops were highly adaptable. Whereas the known world was mostly closed forest and not terribly hospitable to them, and wood specialist eusocial insects dominated those niches, the eastern continent had vast stretches of equatorial shrub and desert that was ripe for the taking perfect territory for these mound builders. Over the next several million years, their citadels became a common site near patches of shrub that could sustain them, but they needed food from their fungus out on the desert. Cacti could provide some nutrients and water, but were unreliable nourishment. Four million years ago, a grass evolved on the eastern continent and proved to be the perfect foundation upon which the prairie termites could build their empire. Housy grass. Grasses have long been present in Chimere. Many species of early grass were brought during the harvest of the late Cretaceous. However, fern prairies tended to have a much stronger hold on any open terrain, and the grasses that could endure harsh conditions on the fringes were the only ones to survive. Following the dynastic extinction and the subsequent climate fluctuations, the floral stability was shaken up just as much as the faunal status quo. Although the eastern continent is still dominated and defined by survivors of the dynastic extinction with a few recent migrants, Miocene flora, like grasses, proved to be very successful, and a lot of the fern prairies in the tropics and equatorial regions have been replaced by grass. Housy grass arose dominant from this intensive arms race of flora, proving a ruthless opponent that rendered soil intolerable to fertile grasses and growing faster and taller than other hardy grass. Its expansion throughout the equatorial regions turned many deserts into prairie. Many species of flora and fauna have been driven to extinction by the expansion of housy grass, but one species of macrotermes turned this devastation into an opportunity. The housy termite. They now had the perfect food supply for their mushrooms. Where housy grass went, housy termites were quick to follow. Their mounds went from an occasional wonder to a regular structure. 
They accompanied the spread of housey grass to the known world, and in the past million years, they and the grass on which they feed their mushrooms has dominated the landscape, only being held in check by the equatorial regions of the northern continent by the Ushalek forest. Housey is a shortening of the shoe phrase that roughly translates to the spread of hungry flames. It is often called firegrass not only for its color, which has almost no green, but also for the propensity for flames. The seeds are coated in a wax that makes them resistant to fire, and after the grass has drawn all the nutrients and water from the soil, flames not only burn away their competition, it helps spread the seeds. Where housey grows, fire is sure to follow. Many killers of the grass, such as large bovids, are burned to provide fertilizer, and locusts, which would be a problem on other prairies, are regularly smoked out. Housey termites are largely unaffected by these fires. They are workers whose sole duty is to regulate the temperature of the mound, and this means they are highly sensitive to approaching smoke. By the time the flames reach them, they have already sealed off the nest, and housey fires never last for long. Many animals will seek shelter at the base or even at the top of termite mounds to survive the flames. The mushrooms growing out of the mound are sometimes burned, but often they are above the line of fire, and the wide base in the mound offers a measure of protection. After the first rains of the season, when the skies are still overcast and the prairie begins to bloom, a portion of the hive emerges as allates, winged individuals of both sexes. Millions of these allates take wing, seeking a member of the opposite sex from another colony. They are not strong flyers, and many are killed, especially as birds, pterosaurs, and other insects gather for a feast. If they find a mate, the pair will then seek out a suitable place to build a tiny mound of soil hardened by their saliva and feces. Once inside, they mate and begin a new colony, with a female laying over 50,000 eggs a day in her prime. Some of these young will become massive soldiers with shearing jaws. Others become specialized in a range of other duties. A few will become allate and fly off once the colony reaches maturity at around five years. Most will become workers, expanding the mound, maintaining its structure, and gathering grasses to sustain their mushrooms. Housey termites are not only themselves giant, with queens reaching seven inches in length, workers half an inch, and soldiers often exceeding an inch or two in extreme cases, their citadels are breathtaking. Rumors of mounds on the prairies of the eastern continent exceeding 100 feet in height are unverified but reputable. Most mounds are between 10 and 20 feet tall, but some in the known world will exceed 50 feet in height. The height of these mounds, often close together in particularly fertile regions, can act as a forest in terms of cover for ambush predators and prey seeking shelter. Housey termite queens are among the longest living insects, some living for over a century. Most mature colonies are home between 1 and 2 million termites, but large mounds towards the end of a queen's reign can have as many as 20 million termites. This bounty has made the housey termite a keystone species. Dozens of eusocial insect specialists are present on the prairie. A resident of the eastern continent, the Moshogu, or giant pangolin, is itself a keystone species in opening up these hard, cement-like nests and providing a sense of order at the feeding sites. Goliath anteaters have developed a symbiotic partnership with the pangolins as an enforcer. I've got a whole episode on the subject, so link above if you want to check that out. The humidity of these mounds also provides water at the height of the dry season. Their mushrooms food for a range of animals, and the structures themselves shelter from the beating sun. This diversity is only possible because of the dramatic success of the housey termite. As you might expect, the termite's ability to construct these great citadels and having such a bounty for themselves to grow means that they are capable and more than willing to defend their homes. Many of these insect specialists must wait for giant pangolins and anteaters to open up the nest because they know they won't be able to endure the defensive assault of soldiers at the edge of the colony. 
desperation leads to extremes, and at the height of the dry season, some animals have endured the shearing bites of a hundred furious soldiers for a few bite of mushrooms, only to succumb to the wounds becoming infected over the following days. The Shu incorporate prairie termites and mushrooms into their cuisine, but even these hardy individuals who will readily let a cobra bite them for a high will approach housey termites with caution and care to harvest without directly engaging with the soldiers. The adaptability, aggression, and social complexity of the housey termite has resulted in its widespread and dramatic success. As a keystone species, millions of animals rely on them for shade, water, nesting, cover, shelter, and sustenance. The housey termite shows that success and massive ecological and environmental impact can often come from small, humble origins. Shout out to the Angry Optimist for sponsoring this episode. Have wanted to debut an episode on insects for a while, and this was the perfect subject, so I really appreciate you reaching out for this sponsorship. Thank you to my Patreon patrons for your support, and my gratitude to all of you for watching this episode. Cheers, folks! I'm not okay, I'm